sign on. Um, Sony, let me know when we should get going. You can start, Kate. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Kate Sussman. I am a longtime member of the Bank Street community. I graduated in 1985 from the School for Children. And then in 1998 from the Graduate School of Education. And since then I've had three children at the school and I'm currently a serving as a parent associate trustee. And tonight I'm your virtual host for this salon. I'm so glad you all could join us tonight. Um, to give a little bit of background, the salon is an annual event meant to highlight an aspect of Bank Street's work and to engage people in supporting that work philanthropically or otherwise. So tonight we are highlighting an issue that is key to the work of Bank Street. That is the important role that equitable practices and a focus on racial justice play in our work with children, adult learners, partners, families, and communities. Before we jump in a couple of ground rules, um, we're gonna keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Uh, we're recording this presentation um, so that we can share it with folks who were not able to come. Um, and you are welcome to keep your video cameras on or not, whatever you prefer. We like to see your faces, but we want you to do what makes you feel comfortable. Um, there will be hopefully time for some Q&A at the end of the session. So please feel free to put questions in the chat directly to the panel and we will get through as many of them as time allows. Um, if we can't get through all of our questions, we will definitely follow up with you afterwards. Um, so you're likely aware that across our nation, uh, leaders in education are engaging in conversation about how to discuss children's identities and affirm their diverse histories, backgrounds, and lived experiences in classrooms and curricula. Here at Bank Street, these conversations have always been central to what we do. We've always believed that relationships are key to, a ch to children's positive growth and development, and we can only have relationships and a sense of belonging when we feel seen and valued. And this is what equitable practices are about. I entered the building at 112th Street for the first time in 1974, and I've returned many times since then to work, to study, and now as a parent. So why do I keep coming back here? Uh, when I was at Bank Street as a child, the institution consisted of the school and the college. In the years since, we have grown to include the Family Center, the Liberty Program, the Education Center, the Strauss Center, um, and more. And through these programs, Bank Street reaches thousands of people every year. Critically, all of these parts of Bank Street extend from the same core. And it's that core, that drive that Bank Street has to center equity in its work with children, with adults and with partners, that is what makes Bank Street a touchstone for me, personally, as a learner, as a parent and as a professional. So tonight I am thrilled that we have Tracy and Mark here to talk about their work and about this question. How do equitable practices and a focus on racial justice come together in our work with children, adult learners, families, partners, and communities? As you listen, we want to encourage you to think about what resonates for you, what do you connect with, and what questions do you have? So as you sit with all of that, I'd like to introduce Bank Street's president, Shale polakow Saransky, to give us some more context. Evening, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Um, you know, I want to start with Bank Street's approach, um, because I think in order to understand our commitment to racial justice, um, one also needs to understand what connects us across the different um, programs, the graduate school, the children's programs, and our public impact work in the Ed Center. So this is not going to be news to most of the people on this call, but I do think sort of, it's always good to go back to the heart of our work as we think about how we extend that work. So I believe we start from a, a set of principles. One of those is that learning must address the whole child. And recent studies from neuroscience um, reveal that actually the different parts of the brain that control social, emotional, and cognitive processes work together and depend on one another when a child or an adult is learning and they're intertwined just like the strands of a rope. 
So we can't split one of them off and say, this is the thing to focus on separate from those others. The second principle is that relationships matter and are the catalyst for learning. And those relationships need to be supportive, responsive relationships, characterized by consistency and an ability to accurately perceive and respond to a child's need by providing both emotional security, knowledge, and support to build age-appropriate skills. So learning happens in the context of relationships. Third, human beings learn best through active engagement using what they're learning about the world around them to construct new knowledge. So effective teachers act as mentors, setting meaningful tasks, watching and, gu and guiding children's efforts, and offering feedback. Fourth, student growth requires meeting learners of all ages where they are developmentally and building from their strengths. To understand those strengths, educators need a deep grounding in human development and the capacity to observe and listen to children very closely to figure out what they need next. And finally, adversity affects learning which means schools and early care settings have a powerful role to play for our most vulnerable students. Stress is a normal part of healthy development and learning, but excessive stress can throw learning and development off track and exert profound effects on children's well-being. Now think about introducing racism into the mix as we think about powerful learning environments and the ways that it shapes opportunities for both children and their families and the ways even subtle forms of bias and discrimination can play out in classrooms. Learning is already a delicate and interdependent dance. And when a child gets the message that they aren't valued or that they're seen as a threat or seen as less likely to achieve, it corrodes those relationships and injects toxic stress into the learning experience. This leads children to disengage and often to give up on school. At Bank Street, we believe every child and adult in our city and in our nation should have access to education rooted in those basic principles I just talked about. So if we care about improving access and really having educational equity in our, in our system. We have to tackle the problem of racism in our classrooms and in our education systems in order to work toward that broader goal. And I hope tonight you'll get a feel for some of the ways that we're trying to do that, both through our research and, and scholarly work, as well as through um, our practice and partnerships with educators and schools and systems. So thanks for joining us tonight, and I'm excited to have a rich conversation. Thank you, Shale. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers now so we can get that conversation going. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Tracy Frey Oliver, Vice President at Bank Street's Education Center. She and her team have been instrumental in the development and design of our equity work with adult and child learners and partners and families and communities. Please say hello, Tracy. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. Um, and then we also have Mark Nagasawa, the director of Bank Street's Strauss Center for Young Children and Families. Mark is a researcher whose particular area of interest is about how teachers, parents, and children navigate policy decisions made about them. Please say hello, Mark. Everyone, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. So let's begin. Um, for our first question, uh, can you start off by talking about why it is so vital to center equity and anti-racism in education and in your work with children and how Bank Street's longtime values connect with this approach? And what about this motivates each of you in your work? I can get us started. Um, 
So it's vital to center equity and anti-racism in education because at Bank Street, as Shale just um, very clearly outlined, we believe that all children can learn and have individual strengths that can be nourished and supported through quality learning experiences and rich learning environments. And while school systems should be designed to foster and facilitate the type of experiences you heard Shale describe earlier, many of our schools have been failing to do that. And they've been failing to do that for a large majority of our students. And unfortunately, that was true well before the pandemic. There have been racial inequalities and in educational outcomes for students across the country for quite some time. And yet we've started to normalize this, expect it, and even worse, in some cases, blame black and brown children for some of these outcomes. And so while there have been lots of educational reform efforts and policies that are focused on attending to these disparities, they often fail. And we suggest that they fail because they don't consider what we know deeply at Bank Street. And that is the research and science behind how children learn and develop, as we were describing just a bit earlier, and the ways in which racism impacts our children's learning experiences and school experiences. So some examples from recent research are that we know that teachers' expectations have a big influence on what children are able to accomplish academically in the classroom. But unfortunately, these expectations are often biased against Black, Latinx, and Indigenous children in ways that contribute to some of the disparities we see in achievement. We also know and heard earlier that there is a power to relationships in our classrooms and relationships really influence the way we learn. And unfortunately, we know that many children do not feel a sense of belonging in their classrooms and that this often happens to students of color um, in many of our schools. Another thing we know about children is that very early on, they start to develop some of these implicit biases. And so it's so important that our classrooms provide learning experiences that allow them to recognize diversity and promote empathy and collaborate and be curious about each other in their classrooms. So those are just a few examples of the way in which they show up in our schools and why it's so important. So I'm gonna build on what Tracy shared with a little bit of data. Um, as she made clear, and as, as Shale also shared, um, these issues have become normalized. And, um, but I wanna share uh, some findings from a, a startling economic analysis that estimates the costs of our failures um, at between 42 and $92 billion for each cohort of Black and Latinx 18-year-olds. Um, and, and that's the accumulated costs of of resources going to misidentification for special education, discipline, grade repetition, remediation, um, and lost economic activity. Um, and while I don't want to reduce this to economics, it's much more than that. Um, it's a sobering finding that really does demand action. Um, another bit of data that I'm going to share is that uh, there's a lot, as Tracy indicated, um, it's been, a, it's been long, known for a long time that these issues um, are known to start in preschool or emerge in preschool, for, um, rather. Um, so for example, one study found that preschoolers are expelled at a rate three times higher than in K-12, um, and that this just disproportionately impacts Black children, um, who in one analysis made up 18% of preschoolers, but 48% of those who were suspended more than once. Um, we've all heard of the school to prison pipeline, um, but sadly, and not to be too deterministic, um, we may need to start thinking in terms of a preschool to prison pipeline. Um, and, and again, to reiterate what Tracy said, while traditionally this has been explained as being about individual problems, um, I can't emphasize enough that the data are abundantly clear that these reflect systemic deficiencies. Um, and then the last bit of data that I'm gonna share is a case example from when I was a beginning um, assistant preschool teacher um, a long time ago. Um, I, I, I can picture these two boys. Um, I know their names. I'll just say A and, and W. Um, a was a white boy, W was a black boy. Both were extremely bright, extremely engaging, beautiful children. 
um, but both also showed some, some, some behavior that we really struggled with in the classroom. Um, at different times, sometimes together, <laughs> they would come into the classroom, pull toys off the shelves, uh, climb on furniture, would have outbursts when we were transitioning between activities, uh, throw objects, you know, brick, uh, blocks, those heavy wood blocks, um, fight with each other, with other peers. Um, we were really out of our depths um, and at a loss. And I, I'm just going to pose a question. Um, I'm going to ask you to guess which one our program director and principal um, decided was a danger to the other children and which one uh, they told us that we needed to work with more, more closely. Um, I want to uh, I want to say that even though we, I talked about expulsion data, he wasn't expelled, um, but over the course of the year, it became clear to his mom that he, he wasn't safe with us, um, and she ended up withdrawing him. Um, and I just want to say that in terms of the kid's question about motivation, um, so I, I remain haunted, truly haunted by what we did to him and to other kids. Um, we were a nationally accredited program. My, my uh, lead teacher was an exceptional teacher. Uh, we were a staff of color, um, and yet this still happened to him. Um, he was a, this particular child, um, but I can think of others, was, was truly bright, vibrant, creative, um, energetic. Um, and, and these memories of these children and my colleagues who are still in the field really guide me as I became, became a researcher. Um, and remind me that behind all these statistics that we often cite are um, people and their lives. Thank you both for giving us all of this context and also sharing these personal stories that are really, really show a picture of, of what this can look like at the, the human level. Um, I'd love to move now to talk about what you're both currently working on. Um, could each of you speak some about the current undertakings in your work that are particularly salient to this? Uh, Tracy, would you start? Sure. So at the Education Center, um, we partner with school systems to disrupt inequities at scale. And what that means is that we work with every layer of the system to reimagine how we do work so that we can attend to many of the challenges that we just named exist in our systems. But I'll name two examples to get a little bit more in the weeds. Um, we have work that is designed to ensure equitable math outcomes for Black, Latinx, and students experiencing poverty. And we're doing that work in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, and Yonkers. We know that math serves as a gatekeeper in many ways for our students and children. So in both of these districts, we are working directly with teams of teachers, principals, and district leaders to identify the teaching practices, but also the policies that have led to their middle school students being disproportionately underprepared for upper grades mathematics. That means who are the children who have access to algebra? Who's getting to algebra two? Who's experiencing pre-calc? And who's experiencing success in those courses? The work we do includes working closely with teachers, students, and families so that we're centering their voices and getting their perspective on what needs to change if we wanna see better outcomes for them. We also do that while building the content knowledge, the, the um, capacity of teachers and educators, but we want all of that work to be rooted in really deep understanding of child development and content, but also a deep understanding of the local context and what children are experiencing, particularly children who don't regularly have a voice around their learning experiences. So that's really exciting work that we're, have, that we're doing at the middle school level focused on math. Another example that's a little different is work we're doing in District 1, and that work is focused on reimagining early childhood from pre-K to second grade, and the focus there is on literacy, and there are persistent disparities in the data around students reading by grade 3. And that's a big issue across the country in many cities, so New York is no different in that way. But in District 1, we are focused on helping teachers and leaders foster student agency, all of the choice and autonomy that we see in our children here at Bank Street, 
what would it look like to ensure that our children in District 1 in New York City have that same level of agency and choice and that they're experiencing developmentally appropriate instruction that also value their cultures and are responsive to their needs so that our youngest learners in the earliest grades can start to have some consistent learning experiences from pre-K all the way up to grade two. And the idea is that they'll start to have more meaningful experiences that allow them to feel more in control of their learning, that taps into their strengths, so that as they're learning literacy and building their skills, it's something that feels more consistent for them and not different and focused on the test that's coming in grade three, but instead what we know is important for kids to learn. Each of these partnerships, I just wanna highlight um, attend to racial disparities that can be found in the data. So whether that's the percentage of Black and Latinx and students experiencing poverty who are successful in upper grades math, or how many of our Black and Brown students are reading by grade three, they all attend to that disparity, but they're also rooted in the idea that there are practices and policies, as Mark mentioned, six systemic issues that have to be addressed if we're gonna see the changes that we wanna see in their classrooms. So I, I think one of the things that I wanna link very closely with is, is all the work that Tracy just described is, um, is what, what we wanna study. Um, and I think it's a very important to study the, 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 the processes and outcomes of that, of that work, because the vast majority of research in education does very important work of, of describing broad patterns and relationships, often numeric. Um, but it's not always clearly useful for educators and policymakers. How do you translate what you find in those data into practice, right? And that's a big, a big challenge. Um, and further, while we know a lot about, we've talked about inequity, we know there's a lot of very solid data, the, the proponents of evidence, evidence is very clear um, about inequity. We don't actually know all that much about the often subtle personal, interpersonal, and in institutional processes that create these inequities and how do we disrupt them? And, and again, that's that's the kind of work that Tracy has done, right? Um, or is doing and, and her colleagues. Um, and so illustrating these things, understanding these processes, looking at um, at what differences that they make is the Strauss Center's niche. And so we, we conduct research on practice, for practice, and to the, the degree we can with practitioners um, and work to translate research into policy and practice. And all of this is focused on addressing uh, the kinds of institutionalized injustices we've been discussing. And just one, a quick illustration. Um, one of our current studies is going beneath the surface of another well-documented issue, which is racial disproportionalities in early childhood special education. Um, you, we're trying to pierce beneath the surface to seek understanding of why this is happening um, by analyzing existing policies and administrative data, uh, it's observing school and systems level practice, what folks are doing, um, and interviewing educators and parents um, to understand their attitudes about race and disability, their understandings of the system and how it operates versus how it ought to operate and so forth. Um, and, and to, to draw some illustrations of why these phenomena happen. Thank you both for that. It's really so powerful to hear about the impact your work is having on the experiences of children and adults in schools right now. Um, and it's really clear how you're bringing the core of Bank Street to so many other schools and also studying the, the what works and why and, and what doesn't work. Um, so I'd love um, to ask you to talk a little bit more about opportunities that you've found to bring your direct connection with uh, folks in schools working, you know, Tracy, you're working directly with school and district leaders and Mark, your, your focus of, on, on study of what works. Uh, where, where are some intersections between your projects and what opportunities do you have to work together? I'll, I'll jump in, um, and, and Tracy can fill in some of the, the, the details, but as we've been, as a, and I'm relatively new to Bank Street, and so part of what I've been doing is learning about the work, who's doing what, um, and just engaging in a lot of conversations, and, and out of one conversation emerged, um, and to Tracy's point earlier about uh, really early inequities in, 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 in math in particular, but also, again, this is across the board, right? Um, we started talking about in early math 
um, professional development partnership that uh, Tracy's team has with uh, District 25. Um, and, and the issue of math in early childhood is a longstanding equity issue, um, both for adults and children. So another well-documented issue is that most um, early childhood educators, um, the majority identify as women, and, and in New York City at least, a good two thirds identify as people of color. Um, but across the board, not here as well as elsewhere, uh, most folks in early childhood, me included, um, don't always identify as math people. And so um, this troubled relationship with the, 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 the subject matter affects how we teach math. Our understanding of it um, shapes how we teach it. And that then has impacts on kids' understanding of math, um, their relationship to it, to it there, it's, it's beauty and its usefulness. Um, I, I, I've, also, I've come to rethink this relationship with math and, and see its beauty and see its um, usefulness and ubiquity um, in the world. Um, and this does show up in, in things that um, may be problematic, but that are indicators, right? Like test scores and later disproportionalities in the STEM fields. And so anyway, our, our work together emerged out of these conversations we were having about the need to better document and understand um, the things that the standardized test scores just can't tell us. Uh, teachers' orientations towards the subject, their sense of professional efficacy, what they're actually doing, how they're implementing curriculum, um, kids' identification with the subject, their engagement, their math reasoning, um, who's being, being reached, who's not, you know, why that might be, and, and what to do differently. And so Shale opened the night talking about relationships. Um, most research talks about relationships in, in numerical data. We're, we're looking at the relationships between people, their actions, um, and various outcomes. So, and, and these kinds of questions really do apply to uh, other areas of teaching, whether that's language and literacy, emotional responsiveness, anti-racism, and so forth. And to add to what Mark said, that I think the exciting um, part about our work is that our, the opportunities for our work together are that we recognize that there's a danger in just implementing these partnerships, right? Getting out there in the field and doing the work side by side while we're seeing really great impacts and experiences for our adults and our children. What just implementing without codifying what we're learning or finding new ways to talk about our impact does is that it continues the narrative that is often deficit um, based when we talk about um, um, students who are black and brown are experiencing poverty. So for us, the, the great opportunity in our partnership is to start to change the narrative around what success looks like. How are we able to show growth, not only in our children, but also in our educators? As Mark mentioned, you know, identifying as someone who's able to do math or, or thinking of yourself as a mathematician is very rooted in your identity and quite often your social identities, including race. And this is work that we do that isn't going to show up necessarily on an assessment or that is going to show up on something else that's easily quantifiable. But we start to see it in the way that teachers show up in their um, the ways that they're willing to learn new strategies, the ways that they're looking at their children, the different types of strategies they employ in their classrooms, and their willingness to do things differently. It creates environments where children feel like they belong and they can try out new things and they see themselves as mathematicians. And so a large part of our partnership is the opportunity to start to create new narratives that disrupt inequity, right? So that we're not only talking about disproportionality based in assessments and trying to get test scores to rise, but that we're also talking about some of the elements that we've all discussed today. And that is whether children feel like they belong, whether they see themselves as, in this case, um, having a math identity, or if they actually feel like their teacher cares about them or there are high expectations for them. And so we're really excited to partner in ways that helps to just shift the conversation around what student success, but also teacher practice looks like. Um, so what are some things that you're learning from your shared work? Well, I mean, I think it's, I mean, it, it, it's early, right? We're, we're these, are, um, these are relatively new conversations that we're having. Um, but we're, we're beginning to co-construct ideas about what evaluation 
of practice means away from sort of the punitive kinds of judgmental of good and bad, um, effective, ineffective, towards really um, incorporating the kinds of thinking that teachers do every day in terms of this is what I think is going to happen, this is what happened, using data, reflecting, using that to reflect, um, and then engaging in hmm, what I thought was going to happen didn't quite happen, why might that be, you know, replanning, re-implementing, and so forth. And so um, in, in lots of ways, that's a very Bank Street approach, um, which has always been very scientific. And so um, that's one of the things is that, it, it, but it's a difficult, um, that's an uphill battle given um, the perspectives that public and private funders often have in terms of what evaluation is, which is showing large effects and those kinds of things. Certainly that's something that we want to look at. Um, but we're be so as a part of our developing a shared understanding of, of how we want to approach a scientific um, approach to learning and studying that learning and reflecting on that learning. Um, we're also beginning to explore different ways of you know, what are, what are meaningful outcomes? And Tracy already talked about some of those kinds of things in terms of kids' identity, their sense of belonging. Those are meaningful outcomes. They're not necessarily recognized that way um, more broadly, but those are the kinds of outcomes that I want for my kids in school. I want them to feel seen and valued and that they belong. Um, and as meaningful outcomes in and of themselves, but as a part of the other kinds of knowledge and skills development that are a part of schooling. Um, so what, I think one of our one of the things we're learning is how do we communicate the the value and meaning of um, these other kinds of of data and other kinds of outcomes um, within perspectives on assessment and evaluation that are um, that don't necessarily recognize those kinds of things yet. And the way we can honor these um, other types of measures, and I think as Mark was getting at, how they sit alongside other measures. And, and the truth is success is often defined in our, in our school systems in very narrow ways, often focused in on testing. Um, and that kind of dominant testing regime doesn't really provide much instructional value. If the idea is that we want to have um, insight into how to shift our practice day to day, based on each individual child's needs and, and strengths, that it takes more nuance than just um, some of the measures that we currently have available. Um, and so I would say that I think what we're learning in our work is that there is definitely value in not just offering up these new narratives, but pushing our own thinking around how we go about how we go about articulating what we believe here at Bank Street. Um, I, I can say that as someone who didn't attend Bank Street and who's a, a Black woman um, who went to public schools in New York City as a child, you know, when I think about the power of a, a Bank Street classroom and what I'm able to observe from the amazing children who attend our children's programs, you know, we don't describe their success in these limited ways. We often acknowledge and highlight their agency, their advocacy, their commitment to social justice, their deep understanding of the content, the way in which we think they'll contribute to society. And so just wanting to extend those same um, beliefs and descriptions of what we want kids to, to do to children who, um, are often marginalized in our country. Thank you. Um, so everything that you are both saying is bringing me to this next question, um, which is that a focus on equity and racial justice is not a one year project. It's the work of a lifetime for individuals and institutions. Um, so what do you think needs to happen to make this focus area deep and sustained? Kick us off here. So at the Education Center, a lot of our work um, consists of grant funded projects and contracts with systems. And, and the reality is that many of our funders do hold um, a, a view of impact that is more narrow in the way we described above. And so there is um, a challenge for us to be able to help funders and those who are looking for immediate impact. You know, you frame the question, Kate, by saying, this is ongoing work. But you can imagine that 
um, funders and those who um, fund the work that we do are often looking for shorter term impacts or have those narrow views that we mentioned earlier. So there's some real work to do to help funders understand that there can be diverse ways and different ways of talking about impact. And then I would say it also requires a relentless and continued commitment from the organization to do this work. And I think you heard that from Shale earlier as he framed our discussion today. Because of our values and our, and our commitment to the Bank Street approach, this is very natural work for us. This is work that we know is essential to be able to support the whole child. And so that means that we have to be in spaces, being clear about our commitment to this work. Um, but also providing resources and space for our teams to do the type of collaboration that Mark and I were just describing, to be able to not just implement the work, but make sense of it, study it, practice articulating it out into the world to help shift the thinking that others have. I think, I don't think I could say anything much more than what, what Tracy has already shared. I mean, I, I, I I do think that um, it, it's under the, the, the focus on short term outcomes is understandable. Um, and I think part of it is there, there can be demonstrable, meaningful, statistically significant um, short term outcomes, but are they the ones that folks are willing to hear about and, 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 and see in relation to some of the other outcomes that we're all concerned about? Um, I think part of that requires um, sort of an orientation shift in, in acceptance of um, centuries of, uh, of, of social building that's happened um, aren't going to be easily undone um, in a, a three-year funding cycle. It, it, it makes it it's very difficult to, to um, undo all the structural weight, the weight of all the stru social structures that uh, kids and teachers and families are, are, are really uh, living within. Um, it does, frankly, it requires um, staffing to do the kind of deep collaborative work that Tracy and her teams do. It requires people um, and it requires people who aren't constantly um, in, in re, you know, living in, in, in resource scarcity and resource deprivation. You know, the constant hunt for the next grant dollar means that that proposal is time that could be spent um, analyzing their own data, reflecting on their practice, doing the work, et cetera. And similarly, I mean, in, in, in research is, is often less, um, less sexy, but it does require specialized skills um, and knowledge, and particularly in the way that we're trying to do it, um, to do it in partnership with the field, in dialogue, in relationship with, um, with, with folks so that it's not just something that is done to. Like I, I remember when I was in the field and folks from the university would come and say, will you help recruit parents and families into your studies? And I remember thinking, cause I was in school at the time, yes, that would be great. And then feeling burned um, by broken promises and um, you know, the idea that this is gonna be for them, for you, when it was really for somebody like me, me now, um, and my publications and those kinds of things. So that, that's not the kind of work that we want to do. Um, but that that does require um, people, and again, that same issue of the, the constant hunt for um, additional uh, financial support makes it, it it makes it hard. It is a part of the work, and and, and both of us know. That it's a you know it is part of the way our world operates, but um, in terms of sustaining the, this longer term effort towards uh, a more equitable equitable society, um, sort of a shared commitment on the part of 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 public funders, private funders, those of us in the field, um, and and the assurances that we are actually trying to be systematic about this work, that we're using data to uh, look in the mirror, because sometimes things that feel good, the data actually raises questions about actual meaningfulness. And so um, that we're committed to using that, that data to make the improvements that, um, that we've been talking about. So many layers of challenges. Um, I want to make sure that we have time for other folks' questions. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Shale. 
who's going to share some questions from the chat. Hi, everyone. So if if you have questions that you're interested in asking, please um, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, I can call on you as well, um, if that's easier. Um, we have about 15 minutes to do some discussion. So there's no wrong questions. We're really interested in what you're curious about. Um, and would love to dig in. So I see Arlene is raising her hand. Uh, excuse me, I do. Thank you, Shale. Should I go right now and ask? Yeah, them? go for it. Uh, so Tracy and Mark, thank you so much. Um, and um, also Kate for and Shell for you know giving us <clears throat> the, all this introduction. Um, I, my question is, I mean, I have sheets full of questions, but uh, the, the main one is, is this really a kind of, I mean, we've been talking about this. I've been a member of the board of Bank Street. I've been involved with Bank Street for so many years. Um, and we've been talking and talking and talking about this for years and years and years. And Bank Street's been involved with schools. We had the Principals Institute and Bernie Meklowitz years ago working with principals. And so I'm just wondering, um, I, I, it, this seems not new. I mean, it's wonderful. Um, and you're, you're, Mark, you're doing the evaluation, but is it a drop in the educational bucket? Because I'm wondering what happens then when you, when you leave. I mean, I, I, I remember when James Comer was doing this incredible work in New Haven and different places. And I have to see in order to believe. I, 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 my ears don't make me believe. I have to see it and experience it. So I made an appointment to go to meet with the principal in, in a few schools um, where James, where the program was operating. And by the time I got there, the, he had gone. I mean, he, he, he kind of thought he left the program there, but, but there were, was no funding. There was one Miss Brown who was maintaining the program, but the other teachers went back to normal, you know, back to what they could handle in a classroom with behavior and everything in the large class uh, number of students. So while I love everything you're doing, I, you know, I want to feel hopeful, but I don't feel hopeful. I'm sorry. I, you know, I so want to feel that this, that's all good. It's all good. But um, I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to reach the systemic part to have systemic impact. Um, and, it, and you're right. I bet when you said three years, I mean, as, as a funder of many programs, I don't expect change in three years. Um, of course not. Um, you know, I, I hope you can understand, can just hear the frustration I feel or the disappointment or something. I just, I just wish I felt hopeful, but I, uh, I love Bank Street. I feel that we have to partner with all the other colleges around because we're like a triage team going around to try to fix this huge problem. You know, these these huge issues that show you five, you know, these issues. So yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Tracy, do you want to take a stab at how you think about um, sort of the balance between progress and and um, the reality that we're we're up against a deep set of um, historically persistent structures here. Yeah, I think so. You said it. I mean, the reality is that we're really excited about the work and proud of the work we do, but recognize that we are um, dealing with structural racism and and systems that have had a really long time um, and, and have found ways to, to remain the status quo. And so I would say part of how we attend to that in our work is, and, and first I wanna recognize everything you said, Arlene, that, that there has been really powerful and amazing work done in the institution for a very, very long time. And part of what we think about in the education center is how we can implement a partnership that is focused on disrupting these inequities, but at the same time, work on the system part of it, 
by ensuring that part of our partnership is focused on working with every layer of the system, but in a way that also shifts their mindsets. It's not just about providing them with the professional development and coaching around their practice. It's also about building their capacity and mindset around their expectations and thoughts about children of color, right? So we are talking to them about um, their own identities, how bias and racism shows up in, in, in them personally, and how that might manifest in their practice. We're simultaneously working with district leaders to say, what are some of the policies that you might have at play that despite this really great work this teacher team is doing in this school that, will that you will inevitably disrupt that work, whether it's that they don't actually have time to meet or that you are advancing a really strict assessment policy that doesn't allow for some of the practices that we allow to thrive. So some of what we hope to do is leave behind a set of mindsets behaviors and practices, not at just one level, but at every level, so that even if a superintendent leaves or there are shifts in roles, that what we've done is create a mindset and commitment and ownership of, of a commitment to, to this type of disruption that can, can stay beyond our time there in the district. But I don't, I, I definitely hear your frustration. Um, I know that frustration well, um, and I know um, communities of color experience that on a daily basis as well. And, and the hope is that we can have this kind of relentless commitment um, despite what, what might feel like a slow pace at times. Thank you. And I know there are other questions. I wanna jump in really quickly. Um, <clears throat> You're, I do agree with you. I think you're right that if we act alone, um, it it is you know a, a a drop in the bucket or you know all the different metaphors we can have about so little, right? Um, but I will say that, and I, I I will link back to the my own anecdote earlier. I think if I had if our district had the kind of support that Tracy is providing, that kind of multi layered, ongoing um, relational kinds of support. I, I can't guarantee that this, because of our society that there would be different outcomes for W, but I do believe that we would have been different teachers. Had I had the access to the kind of education um, at the graduate school, I think I would have been a different practitioner. Um, I, another example of this, I, you know, um, I, I'm racially, I may not be the type of person that you would think would be um, a struggling student, but I was. You know, my mom volunteered in the classroom because I wasn't a good student. She was encouraged to become an assistant um, in the Head Start, got a CDA, became a lead teacher. I mean, I really truly wouldn't be here had there not been folks who said, hey, you're good with kids, you should do this. You know, so it is drops in the bucket, but those things do matter, right? Um, and then the one other piece about uh, to the point of us operating alone, um, yeah, we can't do it all alone. And so one of the things that we're doing is creating networks. Um, I was just in a meeting prior to this one um, with Jessica Charles, who's the director of the Ed Prep Lab. And that's a network of colleges of education across the country that are looking to share ideas about how do we, um, how can we, how can we implement the kinds of lessons learned from setting the setting so that James Comer's really important work lives on, is carried forward, right? And isn't just because somebody somebody retires or the funding goes away that that good work goes away. Um, and so we are work, actively working to develop relationships with, um, with practitioners across the country, with universities across the country um, to scaffold each other's work and, and, um, and learn lessons from each other and actively, um, Maybe one of the lessons learned is that we, a school like Bank Street, a school like Erickson, where I came from, can't do it alone. We're too small. Even major universities can't do it by themselves. No, I'll just stop there. I would just add two thoughts on this question because I think it's an important one. One one deep belief we have at Bank Street is that people, individual human beings who are trained to be great teachers and great leaders, can have huge impacts. Um, as an alum of Bernie Meklowitz's Principals Institute program, the one you mentioned, um, he was my mentor and 
helped me get a new school in the Bronx started um, for kids who are recent immigrants when I became a principal that took the graduation rate in that building from 20% to 80%. Um, and then I went on to become deputy chancellor and help create 600 new schools across the city. And the city's graduation rate for Black and Latino students during that period went up 20 points. So change does happen, progress does happen, and it's not impossible to make a dent. And it's very powerful actually to invest in training teachers and leaders. And Mark's point about Ed Prep Lab, the graduate schools created a network of now almost 30 higher ed institutions that are training teachers and leaders. And a central focus of that generated by those institutions is how do we bring um, these issues of racial justice into the curriculum in a way that haven't existed before. And so that is gonna ripple out to thousands and thousands of people across the country who are gonna be teachers and gonna be principals. I know Jody, you had a question as well. Um, let me pass it to you. That was actually, a, you guys covered it because my, my question was gonna be actually the more hopeful angle <laughs> and saying that you've mentioned several challenges but I wanted to hear more hopeful stories, things that, that drive you and things that keep you doing this work. And I feel like I just heard that. So that was really the, the gist of my question. Great. Um, I see a hand raised, Elsa. Unmute yourself. No. Okay. Hi. Okay. So I'm one of the hopefuls. Uh, and you know, I've I've now lived long enough that I I really feel I have this longitudinal view. I started out. I'm a Bank Street graduate and uh, started teaching in I guess 1965. Set up one of the first Head Starts uh, in New York City. Everything you've said, and Shell, thank you for reinforcing the fact that the Bank Street that, that helped build me is still the same Bank Street. So I really resonate with Arlene's uh, comments and frustrations. I have seen them over the years, but at the same time, I've seen great things happen. And those drops in the bucket, I really think that there's still, that bucket is still filling up. We know there are other buckets or uh, I'm trying to come up with a good bet metaphor that would get, neutralize the bucket, kick it over uh, that are there in society, but we, we can't lose hope. I think we have to stand our ground just as they are. I was thinking that in your evaluations, Mark, and I'm an evaluator, uh, somehow we have to come up with or even investigate questions where some of the findings could actually reach the gatekeepers in society to show them that, that it's, it's not just all those who care about society and care about people, uh, but even those who just care about money or status and power, that there are benefits for them uh, in the long run. And I think the more longitudinal work we can do, I mean, I'm very proud to be evaluating a, a noise teacher scholarship program here in California. I'm talking to you from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, which is all social justice and equity based. Uh, it, these are all uh, pre-service STEM teachers who are uh, being, I guess, given the same uh, grounding that Bank Street uh, both believes in and expresses and transfers to their, uh, their graduates. So, I mean, there are programs around the country. I'd love to know more about this Ed Prep Lab. Maybe San Francisco State is even part of it, but if not, I certainly think the uh, director of the, this particular noise program, the, the PI, on it would be particularly interested in doing it. She's the one who recommended this book to me. Uh, okay, it's, I think it's, some of you would recognize it. Uh, with it's it's uh, well it's it's about it goes into Carol Dweck's uh, growth mindset, but it was also about math. And and Mark, I can really relate to you. I was not at all comfortable with math 
ever. And yet uh, I have seen little glimpses in other math programs that they could have grabbed me there. I mean, visual aspects of, of math uh, were very interesting. So I think there is hope. I think we, we can have uh, an impact in the future. We just have to not let go of our passion and, and uh, let go of, I guess, our eyes on the goal and just stick with it. Thank you, Asa. Um, so we're getting close to 6.30 and so I'm gonna pass it back to you, Kate, to close us out. Um, but thank you for those comments and reflections and I'm sure many listening to the conversation are having their own thoughts and so it'd be great to hear from you um, as you reflect on this evening. Kate, why don't you talk a little bit about how we're going to follow up and sure. thank you. Um, well first of all I want to say a huge thank you to Mark and Tracy for being with us this evening and sharing your work and um, and just the way that you are approaching this really complex and important work. Um, Thanks to all of you who joined us tonight for your engagement. Um, I hope that you can see why I keep coming back to Bank Street over and over, and also why I give back, because I, I, really, I think Tracy really said it earlier, um, because of this relentless work that is happening these, to, to create these, these ripple effects and, and to see that what happens inside a school for children classroom can be happening in every classroom. And um, that is... That is why I keep coming back. Um, so what you've heard tonight is really just a snapshot of what's happening at Bank Street. We hope you're all interested in learning more. Um, so we will be following up with additional materials as well as a link to the recording. So we hope you'll read the materials, share them with your friends and colleagues. Um, and we hope that you'll continue to engage with Bank Street as we forge ahead. And so I also wanna ask that if you can support this work financially that you do so, I think, Mark and Tracy really spoke about a lot of the challenges and how we keep this going. And it, it really is going to take all of us to support it. Um, and on behalf of the Bank Street community and all of our partners, your support is really appreciated and will go far as you can see. So good night, everybody. Thank you again for being with us this evening. It's great to see all your faces. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Karen. Thank you.